So you're probably all thinking, why is a safety engineer here um, mm -hmm. in this business uh, session? But I'm here in my other capacity, which is as chair of Women in STEM Plymouth, um, a local organisation that campaigns for gender equality in science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you this morning about why diversity is good for your business. Um, and I chose this lovely image of pencils uh, to represent diversity, not just because it conveniently covered all the colours in the political spectrum, just in case, um, <laughs> but also because it, um, it represents diversity as just being about difference. So I'm going to use examples that are primarily about getting more women involved in uh, existing sort of job sectors where they're not traditionally employed. But what I'm about to say applies for all the different types of diversity. So whether or not you're talking about differences in terms of age, race, religion, sexual orientation, or indeed political leanings. Um, we're talking about difference and embracing difference. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about is why you should care. Um, and there are three main reasons why you should care about diversity in your business. Um, hopefully the first one is already something that you kind of feel naturally. It's quite intuitive that diversity is good, and diversity is good for business. We all know that businesses thrive on innovation, on lots of different ideas and perspectives coming together, um, and that's certainly true of diversity. So I've chosen here to illustrate that concept with some paintbrushes and some pots of paint, because if you don't use very many different tools in your artist's toolbox and lots of different colours, then you might just end up with a kind of brown smudge. And you don't want your business to be a brown smudge. You want your business to be a vibrant, textured, different coloured painting, a beautiful canvas that someone would hang on their wall or pay lots of money to. Um, so hopefully that first point is a nice easy one. Diversity is good. You kind of feel it in your gut. But even if you don't feel that, you don't have to trust my opinion on this. Lots of people have done lots of research on why um, diversity is good for business um, and how it's good. So you could look at Fortune and they tell you that diversity is good for your bottom line. Or you could look at Financial Times and they'll tell you that evidence is growing as a solid business case for diversity. Or you could look at Harvard. I understand that they're quite big in the business world. Um, and they um, also say that diversity drives innovation. So you don't have to trust me or your gut. You can also look at the data that's out there and the opinion of some fairly big players in the world of business. If you're more of a numbers person, then there is all manner of research out there that tells you why and how diversity is good for your business. The list on the right there illustrates just some of the ways if you look online you can find statistics to back up the fact that diversity will give you better teams, more sustainable growth, better recruitment, all the things that are really good for a business. I wanted to focus on just one of these statistics, which I think is something that we're all concerned about with our business, and that's profit. At the end of the day, that's why we're all here in terms of business. Um, if your company is in the top 25% of all companies in terms of gender diversity, it's 15% more likely to outperform its competitors. That is even more the case for ethnic diversity. So if your company is in that same 25%, but in terms of its ethnic diversity, so it's one of the more diverse companies out there, it's 35% more likely to outperform uh, its competitors. So if you want a competitive edge, which let's face it, we all do, it pays to make your company more diverse. So hopefully we've covered why you should care about diversity in your business. Um, but let's think about what the problem is. We all know, hopefully these figures are fairly um, familiar to you, that we need 138,000 new people, new entrants into the, the digital skills arena in the UK every year. That's over a million people between now and 2025. Um, and, that, and people are struggling to fill that deficit. So why don't we just go out there, talk to all the groups of people that we've traditionally not talked to, let's get loads of women in, let's go to loads of other minorities, we'll fill that, uh, that skills gap and we'll solve two problems with one go. We'll say, we've got more diverse business that's more profitable and more innovative, and we've sorted out this skills gap. We've found people that we've been looking for for so long. Unfortunately, there are at least four problems when trying to do that. Um, and I'm going to just highlight them so that you can think about how to combat them in the future. So it's the two R's and the two P's. First R is recruitment. So um, when you look at recruitment, um, there is a, already a low base from which to start. Um, so it's difficult to find, in this case, 
women who are in these industries in the first place or interested. So if you look at computer science graduates last year, only 16% of them were women. Obviously, in an ideal world, that would be about 50%. So what's happening there that means that we don't even have the people to choose from at the graduate level? And then even when we do, when the percentages are a bit higher, let's take maths, for example, 39%, how are we recruiting? Are we putting things in our adverts like dominant technology posts meeting many leading clients that are unconsciously turning off those minorities. doesn't mean that we mean to. None of these problems, retention, recruitment, pay or promotion, are things that people mean to do. But you can still create your own problems just by a fairly innocent looking job description. So let's say we've recruited some women or some other minorities. Fortunately, in tech, um, which is the reason that we're all here today, uh, women are twice as likely to leave partway through their career as men. Um, and if you look at the reasons for this, it's not childcare. That's what everybody thinks. But actually, when questioned, the majority of the reasons that women leave um, a tech career is working conditions, so they don't get promoted, they work too many hours, and they don't get paid enough. It comes back to those problems. And those are similar issues for men. So how can we deal with those issues? and get women to stay in tech. This is one of the problems. So this is data, um, this is very recent data, I think it's from last year. Um, it's still probably not showing up very well actually, but this is a, these lines are the gap between women and men um, in thousands of pounds per annual salary. If you look at science and, and tech professionals down here, the gap is about eight grand for the same job. Um, and that is quite a disincentive. If you're a woman in tech and you get recruited and you get and you stay and then you get paid, you probably don't get promoted. Um, only 24% of women of directors of STEM companies are women. Um, of the top 10 companies down here that are best performing for gender diversity, none of them are tech companies. Um, only one is a STEM company, although it can be a bit difficult to define that. Unilever is a STEM company. Um, and we generally don't perform the rest as well as the rest of, of Europe, certainly Scandinavia anyway, so we're eating. Um, so promotion is a problem. This is a problem for two reasons as well. It's not just a problem because women aren't advancing, which means that people, women in the industry like tech don't do as well. You can't be what you don't see. So if you're a young girl or a woman starting their career and you don't see directors that are female, how do you think that you're going to get there? and actually women are statistically less likely, they're, in terms of ambition, they're as ambitious as men, but statistically less likely to think that they'll actually make it, which is kind of sad. So those are some of the problems that we do unconsciously. We don't mean to do any of these things. So now what I want to do is use some examples to show you whether your company is big or small or local or international, what you can do to make your company more diverse. I'm gonna start off with big. Um, so my day job, I work for Babcock International as a nuclear safety engineer. And um, I like to use this as an example of a big company because our name is big, as well as us being a FTSE 100 uh, international company. And as a result of that, we have a big diversity policy. We focus on inclusive culture. Um, so the reason for that is that you can have a diverse team. And if they're managed well, they'll perform well, and all the benefits of diversity that I've just talked about will come through and your business will flourish. But if you have a diverse team that isn't managed well, you end up down here. You have lots of people who aren't talking to each other. We've all worked in offices where that's the case. It's not fun, it's not productive, it doesn't get stuff done. And so what we do is we have goals to build a, um, a diverse board, have an inclusive culture, focus on achievement, to try and make sure that we are managing diverse teams well, getting the most out of them. If you're a smaller company, um, so, for example, Clef. Clef are a tech company, they were a startup in Silicon Valley that focused on two factor authentication, which I had to look up because I'm an engineer and not the sort of tech kind, but it's to do with security of websites. Um, they were a really, really small company. They started off with two or three people. And instead of saying, we'll worry about diversity when we're employing thousands, they said, we'll start at the beginning. We'll get an HR lawyer, a diversity consultant, and we'll come up with policies that allow us to pay, promote, recruit, and retain diversely. And then, because they're wonderful, they published it all on GitHub. 
So if you're a small company, you can go out there, you can look at Clef's, uh, Clef's policies, and you can actually seek them out and use them as a model for your business. Another really good example of a small business um, is the Gaza Hackathon. So I imagine people here are fairly familiar with what a hackathon is. They tend to be quite male-dominated. In this particular area, average female attendance was about 20%. So a company called Lady Problems, which is a brilliant title, um, <laughs> run, they run hackathons, and they ran one in Gaza. And they used some really simple marketing techniques um, to up their attendance to 83% female. Um, and they did it by using these six simple steps. Um, making women a priority, setting targets, engaging women early, so we can fit it in our busy calendars, uncover barriers, providing role models, and involving men. So this is something, these are things you can do in a space of weeks to improve your diversity. This is not long-term strategy. This is now. If you're a local company, Plymouth Argyle recently announced that they want to get more women on the board of directors, and they specifically said, not just as faces, we want them there as people who will contribute diverse perspectives. IoTech Global, up at PSP, they're an intent marketing specialist. Their CEO is really pro-diversity, despite being a man. Um, and they sponsor the diversity in marketing and advertising sites. And I would have to say thank you to all the local companies that sponsor Women in Plymouth, Women in Plymouth. One of the best things you can do to improve your diversity is to uh, contact a local women's networking group. And that's us. So thank you very much to all of our sponsors for their support and help. Spotify, brilliant example. They have an annual summit that all their leadership go to that specialises in diversity, sends a powerful message. They have even hackathons mixed, um, and they've got a good practice thumbs up um, as a result of that. And they have this amazing statement on the end of all of their job descriptions. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you look like, or what music you love. We believe that diversity of experience, perspective, and background lead to a better environment for everyone. Who wouldn't want to work? So, Apple Women in STEM Plymouth help you. A quote from Project Include, who are an amazing open source resource if you want to inc increase your diversity in tech. Check them out. Change is hard um, and it's difficult. So what we do is we promote our members and we promote things to our members. So if you would like to talk to our members about your business or you have a service that you offer our members or you would like to talk them to come and talk to you about what they do so that you can improve recruitment? Do you have world-class facilities that you would like to show off and talk to us about? Then please, come, let's have a go. Um, it's a brilliant way of getting more women involved in your business. We support our members because it can be a lonely life being a woman in STEM. Um, so what we do is we physically connect them through networking um, by making them do um, strange things with nails. <laughs> You know, we go at that seven that's the sound of down the hall, I think. Um, and we give them social connections as well, which is incredibly important in retention in tech and in STEM. And we inspire the next generation of women in STEM. If you would like to be part of our careers fair um, in the 15th of November this year, to where last year we inspired over 200 young women into thinking about a career in STEM, then please get in touch. That is all I wanted to say on diversity. I've overrun a little bit, but thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to talk to me about any of these things later, then um, please do. And for now, I'll take probably a question, I imagine. <coughs> so does anyone have a question on that? When you were going through on your bad cut side, mm. one of the first ones was like unconscious bias. Yeah. And, and then you moved past it. How do you change bias when it's unconscious? So, one of the things, we do quite a lot of work with unconscious bias training, and actually at Babcock we have unconscious bias training as mandatory for all employees. Um, so it's not about getting rid of unconscious bias. A lot of people seem to think that, um, that you have to remove that bias. It's okay to, to look at a person who's different and think, it's what you do then that matters. It's about saying to yourself, okay, I thought that, but actually that's not real, that's just my gut reaction, let's move beyond that. And that's the sort of training that we give to people. But I see your point, it's a slow process and society has to change as well. It's not even about individual companies, it's about much bigger than that. And that's one of the things that women in STEM try to do. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you.